All right. So the position of the African People's Socialist Party since day one has been all African political prisoners must be free. The U.S. government crushed our revolution, killed our leaders, chased us into exile, and jailed many of those who survived until this very moment. We must do everything in our power that we can to freedom. So we're going to first introduce onto this panel uh, Chairman Amalia Chatella, who was jailed for two years by the government for tearing down a grotesque and offensive mural painting of Black people in 1966 in St. Petersburg, Florida. This was the first Black power action. He launched a campaign to free Desi Woods, an African woman sentenced to 22 years for killing a white attempted rapist with his own gun in the 1970s. He created the African National Prison Organization to defend and free Black people imprisoned by the colonial policy of the U.S. government. He created the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations, which is also campaigning for the release of African political prisoners in the U.S. Who are chairman. Our second presenter we have on here is Yejide Owen Mila, the, the, the president of the African National Women's Organization, a worldwide mass organization of the African People's Socialist Party that brings African women into the revolution. They are involved in campaigns such as Stop Kidnapping Our Children, Arrest the CPS Campaign, a process organizing African women to stop the state from stealing our children. And our third, our third panelist this evening, uh, my direct leadership, Columbia and Danette, the current international president of the International People's Democratic Uhura Movement, organizing the African working class in Africa, in Europe, Jamaica, and right here in the US for the revolutionary national democratic program to put power into the hands of the African working class. She came into political life in the African working class resistance that erupted in Ferguson in response to the police murder of Mike Brown in August, 2014. She recently contested elections for the post of all the women in Ward 23 of St. Louis, Missouri. The U.S. prisons full of African people and other colonized people has the highest number of prisoners in the world. Uhuru comrades. Uhuru. And I want to kick things off uh, this evening uh, with Chairman Amali Chitella. I want to open it up to you, Chairman, just to speak um, a little bit on the significance of this topic. All African political prisoners must be freed. Uhuru Chairman. Uhuru, thank you uh, so much, Comrade Dexter. And uh, want to uh, just express my appreciation for the this uh, particular panel and its significance uh, uh, going into this uh, second day of, uh, of the uh, second of the third plenary of our seventh Congress. Uh, there hasn't been a real uh, opportunity for the people who are participating in this panel like to get together and have some kind of uh, discussion about exactly how this would go, but I want to open it up uh, with uh, uh, a recognition that this discussion is not a new discussion for us. We're talking about 50 years of relentless leadership. And uh, uh, I want to just quote from uh, the working platform of the African People's Social Party going back to 1979 and point six and seven, I wanna read them before turning it over uh, to comrades uh, Kalambayi and uh, Yejide. They're smiling, am I stepping on your participant? Am I stepping on what you're going to be doing? Okay, so point number six, we want the immediate and unconditional release of all black people who are presently locked down in US prisons. Uh, we believe that all uh, the African men and women who are locked down in US uh, concentration camps, commonly known as prisons, are there due to decisions, laws, and circumstances uh, which were created by aliens and foreigners for their own benefit and as a means of genocidal colonialist control. We believe that these decisions, laws, and circumstances were created and are enforced without our consent and, and are therefore illegitimate. Um, we believe that the African uh, men and women who are locked down in these concentration camps are victims of US colonial ruling class justice, uh, which maintains our enslavement and terrorizes our people and that they should therefore be released immediately to the just representation representatives of our struggle for liberation, independence, and social and socialist democracy. Number seven of the 14-point platform of the African People's Socialist Party. Again, this is something that was created in 1979. Uh, it was uh, something that uh, 
the 1981 first Congress of the African People's Socialist Party uh, adopted officially uh, at that Congress. Number seven, we want complete amnesty for all African political prisoners and prisoners of war from US prisons or their immediate release to any friendly country which will accept them and give them political asylum. We believe that the US prisons are used as illegitimate, as, as the illegitimate tool for torturing, murdering, and holding captive those courageous daughters and sons of Africa who through their patriotic uh, deeds or spoken or written words in support of the cause of our liberation have become political prisoners and prisoners of war. We believe, uh, along with the majority of the people of the world, that it is the duty of the enslaved to resist slavery and colonialism and to fight for socialism. And those who do so are patriots and heroines and heroes and should uh, be held in the highest esteem. So this is, this is how we see prison issue and how we see uh, the question of political prisoners. And I know that these comrades are gonna say some things uh, uh, to extend this discussion. But I wanna say that historically, African People's Socialist Party has always, uh, since its inception, been involved in this question of, of political prisoners and prisoners of war. There's never not been a time. In 1966, even prior <clears throat> to the founding of the party, uh, I uh, became a political prisoner after tearing that mural down, and uh, which was the first uh, direct action uh, uh, black power uh, action in this country. That would happen uh, uh, in, in December, <clears throat> December 29th, uh, 1969. Uh, March 2nd, I think it was, uh, just uh, 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 less than four months later, uh, the, that example uh, is what pushed the Black Panther Party uh, in Sacramento, New York, into an act against at the state assembly uh, there, uh, where many people got arrested. And I spent uh, uh, much of the time after that, up until 1973, in and out of prison. And the party uh, stood uh, struggling uh, with this case of, uh, that I carried from my SNCC experience all the way into the creation of the African People's Socialist Party. And even a year after its founding, uh, it took a year after its founding before uh, we were able to push ourselves free from that. But there was a case of Connie Tucker, uh, political prisoners out of Florida also, who had one time been the Florida chairperson of JOMO and was one of the founding members of the African People's Socialist Party who was arrested in Tampa, Florida. And she was arrested in Tampa, Florida uh, for possession of marijuana. And uh, the, 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 the trial was so <clears throat> ridiculous, the charge <clears throat> was so clearly politically motivated that they convicted her despite they had no evidence. They had no evidence. They said, we don't have any evidence because we had to use it all up testing it to find out what it was. And so uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and she was sentenced to prison. She went to prison because of that. We struggle around uh, this question. Al Courtney was another of the comrades who were in the party. So we have that kind of history. And then of course we were engaged in struggles around Angela Davis uh, uh, and other people uh, who uh, uh, were political prisoners around this country. Around 1968, I think it was, the Socialist Workers Party, which at the time uh, uh, was a Trotskyist organization that, uh, that uh, factored into the development of Workers' World Party and some of the other iterations that's come subsequent to that, uh, uh, they had decided they were going to have an anti-Vietnam War mobilization. And I think the theme was something like uh, uh, no more Vietnams. And they had met and determined that uh, there would the only slogan uh, would be something to the effect of bring the boys home. And uh, so uh, me and a couple of other comrades attended that conference they had in Gainesville, Florida with shotguns and stood up on the platform and said, there's nowhere in hell. We're going to have a statewide mobilization uh, here in Florida uh, talking about bring the boys home. And that's the only thing that's going to be said. We got too many political prisoners, all these political prisoners, Africans being locked up everywhere. We're going to use this to demand the freedom of political prisoners and the mobilization in terms of where it's going to be. It's going to be held in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, after they came out from under the tables and stuff like that, they agreed that uh, it should be held in St. Petersburg, Florida, and that we would be able to talk about the issue of political prisoners. 
I'm just saying this, that there's never been a time. Uh, Desi Woods uh, became one of the most significant uh, political prisoner, uh, prisoner struggles that happened in this country. It, it was responsible for, under the leadership of the party, the first uh, 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 mobilization, mass mobilization happened in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, under uh, held by the pro-independence or the anti-colonial African movement. Uh, in many, many years after we had been crushed, we held demonstrations in, in Plains, Georgia, which was uh, the hometown of James Earl Carter, who was a plantation owner, a white man who became president of the United States. We, uh, we fought and made the, the U.S. government have to free Pitts and Lee, uh, two young uh, African men who had been locked up for 12 years uh, for uh, murder of a white man that another white man had confessed to having done. And so uh, we just we've always been engaged uh, in this issue of political prisoners. It's not new to us. And uh, we formed the African National uh, Prison Organization uh, as a consequence of groups getting together with the party after the uh, Desi Woods mobilization in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, having uh, achieved an element of confidence that is possible. Uh, for us uh, to organize an anti-colonial movement around the question of prisoners. And, uh, uh, and, and this contributed also further to the political uh, prison work we did. Uh, the head, uh, the uh, main organizer for the Africa National Prison Organization uh, was Mafundi Lake, who had been a political prisoner uh, in uh, uh, Alabama and uh, who uh, was fighting, has historically fought around that issue, fought around it when he was in prison, fought around it when he got out of prison, and was just, uh, that's, that's a statement about the, the party's involvement uh, in the issue of political prisoners, prisoners of war, and why it was absolutely something we had to do. So uh, uh, I think, I just wanted to introduce it, I guess, to that extent and hope, as I said earlier, uh, that I didn't step on uh, the presentation that anybody else was going to make, either of these two comrade sisters were going to make. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over uh, to you and uh, um, who who is who is leading this now? Uh, should I say? Oh, who, Chairman? Oh, thank you, thank you. Now, no, no. So go ahead. Uh, who? Who? Yeah, no, yeah, no toes were stepped on. Uh, I just want to appreciate that presentation. <laughs> just uh, like, well, come right yesterday, mate. You want to finish? You want to follow up yesterday? Yeah, yeah. We're gonna well, Columbia, y'all, y'all can. You know, I know everybody's eager to do it, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You're on mute, comrade. Oh, someone. Oh, we need a mute. We need to unmute these comrades. Oh, 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 struggle toward African redemption and this entire African People's Socialist Party plenary has been dope <laughs> so far the first two days. And I just really appreciate the leadership of our chairman. Uh, a, a huge salute to the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, Chairman Omalia Chappella, who is my direct leadership. And um, just all of the developments that you have uh, given to the African nation over the last 50 years. The, the main one for me is the whole question of really determining that the contradiction for us is colonialism. Because if we don't understand colonialism, we won't understand the political prisoner question. Because we have a lot of the people who are organizing in uh, and around this issue talking about racism, as if racism was the basis for why African people are, are, are in jail for 60, 70 years underneath um, these claims of resisting against the, the imperialist system. But that's not it, it's colonialism. And without that, profound development that was contributed to the African nation, like we would still be in a shroud of mystery around who it is our, who it is our enemy, who, are, who is our enemy and what we have to do to destroy our enemy. Because when we're talking about racism, it's like the only thing we gotta do is negotiate with, the, with racists <laughs> for them to, to free us or for them to have a position that will allow us to be out of jail or we just have to just make them like us a little bit differently in order for us to win our freedom. But the harder position to take, the more finite position to take is that we have to, because colonialism is uncompromising, right? Like we have to 
either be colonized or not colonized. And the way that we are not colonized is by destroying the colonizer, destroying the colon colonialism. And these political prisoners who are in jail, the colonial jails right now made a conscious decision to destroy the colonizer. They, they made a conscious decision to organize other African people to also destroy the colonizer. And their, their, their place right now in the colonial prison system is, uh, as a, is a, what is it, is a um, example to other African people that you should not do what they did. That's why Sundiata has been in jail for over five decades. That's why Rochelle McGee has been in, in jail for over 60 decades, 60 years, um, because, um, you know, because they're an example to any African who would ever think of challenging the system. And a lot of the, the appeals to the people to get them out, colonizers to get them out has been more about health issues, but the colonizers will help them, will help them die there. They will, as we struggle to get them out, we have to shift the positions of power to our African people and really free African people from these prisons. Because when it comes to veterans and patriots of the African nation, it's not the ones that went into war to fight for um, the U.S. colonizers to, you know, to, to dominate some other place around the world. It's the Africans who actually gave their life to make sure that we would be free actually took up arms against the colonizer to defeat con colonial, co colonialism. And so for that, we really have to really raise up our political prisoners and also fight to make sure that they, um, their stories and that their freedom is achieved through our efforts. We can't depend on the colonizer to be swayed by you know, goodwill, but we African people have to demand that these African heroes be freed from the, the, the clutches of colonialism and fight for their freedom to make sure that it's so. And so I just truly appreciate the chairman's political analysis around this and, the, and just really just dealing with this whole question of colonialism because that helps African people understand the context under which we are living so that we, don't, we, aren't, we aren't confused about why uh, you can, you can uh, the cop walked off free after killing a child we're not confused as to why um, white vigilantes chase down a black man and murder him and then submit the video to the police to the police and they still have to go on trial as if that's not evidence enough that they've just committed murder. Um, we're not confused by that because even regular everyday white people are an arm of the state. They operate just like the police. They operate just like every other white person ever operated in the in the in the foundation of colonialism to protect what is theirs, and that is the colonial question, the whole question of colonial, they are here to, to protect that thing. So we also have to recognize that in the US, this is a colony. White people are indigenous to this land. <laughs> they came from Europe, came here, colonized the land, destroyed the people, kidnapped, created a worldwide system of, of capitalism based on the, the kidnapped and trade of African people and the theft of our resources and the, and the, and the um, commodification of our land. And they use our labor to build up their entire worldwide monetary system. In addition, their power structure, colonialism is the thing that did that. And so when we look at that and as the way, as, if we look at that as the foundation of the United States, then we know that everything that was erected underneath those premises are the things that, that is, is there to protect the colonizers. They're created by the colonizers. They're that, that was created to protect this thing that they created based on them killing, raping, pillaging, exploiting, oppressing the entire world. So this is the basis for why courts are created, schools are created, um, museums, and, and, and who the heroes are, who are not the heroes, who are the enemies. The preconditions for all of that has been based on colonialism. I just wanted to just really emphasize that because um, I just think that without that, it's really hard to really have discussion around political prisoners. It really is. Because then you, you think that, oh, they just being mean to these, these Africans um, and they just don't wanna let them out. And that's just, not, that's just not the case. And so it also really helps us understand why somebody who might not, who made a conscious decision, you're not political, they weren't politicized to a certain degree, like, but they know that they will be in a press like Desi was behind us. Who, who we identify as a political prisoner because she directly killed the colonizer. 
to destroy the colonizer that was trying to um, to uh, rape her. And she and that was the basis for the party's first organizing of um, the Free Dusty Woods campaign and really the most first international campaign that the party worked on. That's significant because even in these acts that we that we are engaged in, we recognize that we are fighting against the colonizer. And even folks who aren't fighting or killing the colonizer, killing one another in our in our communities, these are conditions that were created because of colonialism. That these are the issues that the crack economy, the 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 poverty, the all of these things that have been created that 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 creates the the, the economic and social conditions that African people are subjected to, um, and the, that African people who are colonized are interacting with each other and every day and understand the world based on these conditions that colonialism created. So that's why we start to see that a lot of African people are being incarcerated because of the conditions that we are subjected to because of colonialism. And that's what in all African people are in, 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 in reality, political prisoners because we are still colonized. We haven't destroyed colonialism yet. So anything that we are engaged in because of colonialism, the conditions that colonialism created makes us all political prisoners. And so, and so um, I just wanna appreciate the chairman for also making that, drawing that conclusion around, you know, just the, the question of colonialism and how that relates, not just to political, conscious political prisoners, but for all African people who are still struggling to, to define the world for them, ourselves within the system that um, is, you know, still dominating us. And so the essential question for us is that we at the African People's Socialist Party have also determined that we have to destroy the colonizer, that there is no way out for us. And this is the only position that we have to take. And there is no negotiation. There is no, you know, fiddle faddling about about how we're going to get to that point. The conclusion is that if we ever want to see our political political prisoners freed and free them all, and all the jails opened up, we got to destroy colonialism. We got to destroy the structures that keeps those keys and those locks in those jails. Mm-hmm. And we have to do everything possible to make that happen. And so that requires the party to organize and to build and to go out into the world and recruit and bring in more members so that we can actually be the mo- that we are building the motor force for ending this relationship that African people have with the col- colon- colonial colonizer. And so, you know, it's really important that we, that in that context that, you know, I'm the, I'm the president of the African National Women's Organization. So I definitely want to bring in some discussion around just the, the way that African people African men and women are being impacted through the carceral state, uh, the colonial state around, um, you know, what impact it has on our community. And so we start to see that um, although African people in general are incarcerated at um, higher rates, African women are are also being pushed into prison at the support, like at higher rates than any other women in, on, in the United States, even though we are the majority woman in the United States. So that really helps us understand that just like we have schools where children, where black children are criminalized more, we have black children who are being kidnapped and taken out of homes of black parents. We have African men who are incarcerated at higher rates. We have black women who are incarcerated at higher rates. This is not a coincidence. It's not because of racist policies as people like to identify. It's because of the colonial structure that has, was erected on the oppression and exploitation and, 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 and murder of African people. This is the pedestal upon which the system has been founded. And so it's gonna to continue to be parasitic and take from us everything, including the very basis of our lives, our interactions with one another, and also determine for us what is right and what is wrong, because at one point, um, slavery was legal. The, the, at one point you can kill 20, African people and that, Nobody blinked an eye. And so, you know, the colonizer determines what is right and what is wrong. And of course, African, anything African is wrong. I mean, it's even um, the basis for how, you know, you can have police in schools primarily around, you know, I, I like to bring this up because even though white children are the ones that are going up and shooting up these schools, the most, Af- most police are in black inner city schools, policing our children. 
creating an opportunity for them to cultivate this relationship and identify how they can get more of African people off of the street through their relationship to us in schools and every other place that they are. And so I say that because even in the African National Women's Organization, we had to contend with that, with a, a campaign that we did called Black Girls Rap Wednesday, where we had to contend with like these policies in school that would criminalize African children. And that at these young ages, we had to contend with the police. And so there's always opportunities for the colonial state to come in and criminalize African people. And at every single point, we should be challenging them, calling the colonial question, making sure that they understand that they operate as a, a colon, as, as the, as the um, a colony, colonial army in our communities. And that everybody else knows that too, so that there's no question about the relationship that the police have to us and the, police, the, 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 the relationship that the, the, the penal state, the colonial penal state has to us as well. And so, and, and it's also really important to identify like African women and uh, that, that most of the things that they are going to jail, that we are going to jail for is drugs. And let's just take a step back around drugs offense because like drug offenses and how that has impacted the African community. I mean, it's the state, the US colonial state that flooded the African community with crack cocaine as a measure to, to, to bring down whatever was left of the Black Revolution of the 60s, it created uh, a devastating toll on the African community. It devastated our entire community. Our mamas was on crack, aunties and uncles, somebody was stealing from us, our brothers were selling it. It created a devastating toll on our community and the US government facilitated that. And this is the highest reason why Black women are in jail right now is because of drug offenses. So it's a, it's a secular thing that is created by the colonizer to ensure that they always are attacking and, and, and yeah, attacking African people. You know, they've created this drug war that has lasted um, decades and still continues to be a, a major input and, and, a, and a surefire win for making sure that Black people stay in jail. And when we talk about how this impacts Black women more is that mothers who are Black women or people or women who are in jail are, many of them, 60% of them are like the primary caregivers for our families. So when you incarcerate a Black woman, you are basically, you know, destroying the relationship that they have to their husbands or to their families and definitely to the children that they are mothering. And so this tears at the fabric of the social fabric of the African community where you can destroy. I mean, there's so many ways that the state is tearing away at the African community. And this is just another thing that's added to it. And the weight of that is, is really insurmountable, it's immeasurable. And there's no way that you can negotiate with the state to end the imprisonment of African people. You have to destroy it. You have to destroy the colonial state. You have to do it. There's no way out. And then there's also like other ways that African women are impacted, even if they're not in prison. Like there are, um, there are uh, African women who support people and their loved ones who are in prison. There are, even when black men are incarcerated, their the black fathers are incarcerated. They're, they who are the breadwinners of the family that creates a, a whole a whole ripple effect that impacts the entire community, particularly with black mothers who with whom they are sharing their resources with. And then, in, like there was a 2015 study with the New York Times that said that there were 1.5 million black men who were missing just off the face of the earth right like there's <laughs> black there's like 1.5 million black men missing 600 of those 600,000 of those they have documented who are in prison and there's another 900,000 who are prematurely dead or there's just no they're not in public view i'm not sure what that means like they said it's not in public view but that is a tremendous sort of statement to the devastating impact of colonial, it's like a tremendous like example of what genocide is, and the the and and the and prisons stale in the car. I'm sorry, prisons in the carceral state is is like really a key component of that. And when you look at like like even how like this prison question really erected, it was like you know after you know so-called slavery ended and, 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 and African people had, were, were emancipated. Um, here they come now with this thing called Covington leasing where 
um, they like, oh, let's get all these niggas back in jail. <laughs> you know, let's get these, let's get, let's get them to still do all the things that we need them to do, and we're just going to incarcerate them. And that really just helps you understand like how it is that now prisons are an economy for towns, little white honky dunk towns somewhere in the in the in the Omaha mountains or does Omaha have mountains? I don't know, but like somewhere in the mountain, somewhere Colorado, whatever. These honky dunk towns now have federal prisons, and their economy of the towns booms because these inmates. These Africans who are in prison, making, um, uh, employing, you know, people to be in their jails, but they also are producing material to be sold, um, is, I mean, it just really, it really just brings it 100% full focus to Africans who might have been um, in the dark. Um, because when you start to look at one thing and it leads, and I've just talked about a whole bunch of stuff, when it leads to one thing and another thing and another thing, that there is there's no pocket that we can be in to kind of work on this narrow issue without really looking at what we really have to do. Because that narrow issue can be overturned, a narrow thing that you might have won around the question of political prisoners and just prisons at a general, that thing could be won, but it could be overturned tomorrow because the same people who are in power. Colonialism is intact, and colonialism will rectify itself unless we unrectify it by destroying it. Unless we build the capacity for ourselves and our people to have to build our own, but to, by destroying this this entity, this the social system. And so, I know I might have talked all over the place, but I really just um, wanted to capture like the whole question of prisons recognizing the conscious revolutionaries who consciously gave their life to ensure that African people would be free. And to also understand that we are not yet free means that we have to make tremendous moves to get that freedom, to open up the gates, unlock the gates and let our people out so that we can realize and at that point, we'll know that we realize a, 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 we have created a, the conditions to which we can start to rectify our issues because we would have won. Colonialism would have been done. We would, not been, we would no longer be colonized and we can free, free them all. So I'm just gonna stop there. Uhuru, Uhuru, Comrades. Uhuru. 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 Oh, who president president? I just want to ignite what you said, comrade. Uh, you know, free them all, and you know, just want to just salute what you just said as far as, um, you know, any struggle that's not to overturn colonialism is short sighted. And just one thing you said towards the end, as far as even if we were to get some little kind of concession or some little victory because of the small struggle, it could still be overturned if we don't take down the entire system. So I really want to appreciate what you just said, um, comrade. Now I want to pass it over to President Kalambai Uhuru. 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 Um, I just really want to appreciate um, Chairman Amali Yeshitela and Yejide and being a part of this panel um, and being part of a member of the African People's Socialist Party and, you know, just being on this panel um, talking about political prisoners. So, um, you know, I represent the International People Democratic Uhuru Movement and the international president, and um, a lot has been laid out and said, and I unite full heartedly with you know, everything that Chairman said and everything that Yejide say. And the thing about African and nationalists, like we all, you know, are saying the same thing no matter where we are. And um, that is what attracted me to this movement. And when we're talking about political prisoners and we um, talking about, and as the leader of um, the International People Democratic Horror Movement, the, our mass organization um, in the hand, under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, it's super critical what we're saying is um, theory is key. Um, it's so important for the African working class to know who they are and who their enemies are because everything that has been given to us, everything that we know about ourselves, everything that has been defined, what is a crime, what is um, a prisoner has been defined by the very people that have enslaved us. And, um, you know, so I always, you know, think about, you know, IPDOM and ANWO, mass organizations, we are on the grounds, you know, um, doing practical work, you know what I'm saying, to deepen the understanding of, um, uh, of our oppression, uh, of our oppression. Um, and African people have to understand this, uh, this whole thing. 
So I know when I came into political life, the burning spirit point, um, and Chairman said, I hope I ain't um, step on nobody told you didn't chairman i appreciate i'm happy that you read those points because that's exactly where i was going i was going to page 10 because that became my bible um and in when reading page 10 and even talking to people um about page 10 and reading these points i remember reading it and being like having a whole fit like wait a minute or they tripping they said they want to open up the doors and let all of the and people, I'm like, wait a minute, you know, like, uh, it's some molesters, um, it's some people, like, wait a minute, y'all want to open up the doors, but I remember Chairman saying, you either want the power or you don't, you can't share power, and so when you really understand colonialism, you understand that it got to be destroyed, it's no um, good colonialism, it ain't no peaceful colonialism, and so you have to understand that they can't say who goes to jail and they don't because they are the criminals that have raped, um, committed genocide and horrific things to our community. And then they are the defining fact of who go to jail or not. No, open up the doors. And that is gonna be a job for many, as I heard Chairman say, that's gonna be a job. Um, and when we get free, we gonna have to open up the doors and decide who gonna be in jail and who's not. And a lot of them that have been putting people in jail is gonna be in. And so these conversations, when we're talking about political prisoners, we just laid out, we, you know, um, it's people that are conscious political prisoners. And then we have pr people that they have demonized or um, because of the contradictions in our community of being colonized individuals that they put in jail and how yesterday just laid it out so beautifully, just laid it out, just point blank period, how it affects the whole community. The whole community suffers from this, um, this whole institution that they have called prison. And the whole white world benefits off this thing. And then if we don't understand, if we don't take this um, message on the grounds, because as we talk about this, what I, um, what we want to stand to gain in everything that we do, what is the two what in? The two what in is that we have to organize, organize, bring the African working class into political life so we can help them to understand. Cause you, if you don't know who you are, you will be speaking as your oppressor. I did. I will hear people say, well, you know, they deserve to go to jail. You know, um, well, that's, you know, we are asked them to enslave us, you know? And so that's why theory is so critical, comrades. And the work that we do is so critical. Um, it's a time um, I was looking in the archives and talking to um, comrade Massimilla Odom that's always in the archives. And we was talking about the political prisoners and looking at the history of the party. And as Chairman said, it has never been a time that the party has not been clear on this question and has not been organizing constantly on this question. And it was a time that in certain prisons, um, and this is why the George Jackson level is so critical. It was a time that people couldn't come on the yard unless you was a hood. Um, we have to turn these factories into um, institutions of um, collect, uh, revolutionaries the African internationalists, that's what these um, institutions have become. So, you know, Director Akile with the um, getting the Burma Spirit newspaper inside of those prison, prisons are, are critical, but it, we can't just be happy with that. We have to go beyond that. And so the George Jackson level, and even us calling it George Jackson level, the party, um, you know, um, called this the George Jackson level before Columbia came into the picture. And so I um, was on the phone talking with Chairman, and he said George Jackson, you know, got political in prison. So we see that um, brothers and sisters go to jail, and then they get um, go into the library and they deepen the understanding, the understanding why they got there and who put them there, and all these things. And George Jackson, that's what that's what he represent. So when we raise his name up, that's what we saying. We saying that we understand, um, sister, brother. You know what I'm saying? We ain't we ain't blaming you for the situation that you find yourself in prison. You know what I'm saying? But you have to come under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party so you won't just be the class, but you will be the greatest attachment of the African working class. And so, you know, um, and the work that we are doing in San Diego, you know, that we did in San Diego, um, who now is the chair of the George Jackson level um, that is going to be carrying this campaign out and on um, Monday, when you we lay out our report, you will hear 
more details on the George Jackson level of how we're going to be organizing wherever we are. And if you're a member of the party, this is what we're going to be carrying out in our region strategies, how we're going to be building everywhere we are. So on the grounds, and we know that everybody in the African community knows somebody that's in prison. This is the reality that we live in. And so this is another tactic and a strategy that the party has always had to win. You know what I'm saying? To win, to make this revolution because the masses are nothing without the African People's Socialist Party. And the party has to win the masses to win our liberation because none of us are free unless we are all free. And so we have to grind hard because just being a, you know, we are not just a thinking organization. We're not just one that puff our heads of having great debates and conversation because there's some people out here that's organizing that, you know, say that they raising up political prisoners and that's just all that it is. But we saying the to what end is liberation. That is what it is. Complete liberation to redeem African people and using, um, and that's why political prisons have to be high up on our agenda. And also one of the things that, you know, uh, you know, that we have to do more work on that is very critical because um, EPDM is a democratic organization. We fight for the democratic rights. We can't let the neo-colonial puppets have no space. And they try to take these spaces. Here in St. Louis, we had a workhouse. They try to change the whole narrative to be about just closing down the workhouse because of the conditions. No, we were saying, let them out. They don't even need to be in the workhouse with these petty crimes because they can't pay a $50 ticket being held in the conditions of the workhouse. But the neo-colonials got in front of the movement and changed the whole narrative and then gave people a pacifier by closing down the building. But the conditions is still the same. People are still being held with a $50 ticket and now they have to travel and family have to travel far because they don't shut down the workhouse. See, this is why you can never let the neo-colonial puppets lead this struggle because they would change the narrative and they would, they would sell us out. And that's what the opportunity is. They will sell us out every time. And you, you out there protesting, yelling, think you getting something and you ain't got nothing. And so that's why we have to make sure that our line is very crystal clear and not allow the neo-colonial puppets and these opportunists, the white left, to get in front of this question of political prisoners and try to carry this conversation. We have to. This is our, we have to take up the space. And so even when we're talking about um, um, teaching people how to actually go and be jerks, you know what I'm saying, to be on the jerks, to um, actually use this as another tactic of uh, revolutionary strategy. Knowing that, you know, simply just being on the jurors ain't going, um, that's not going to be the end goal. But to what Chairman says, he always say that they can do business as usual. So that's what we create, um, you know, a uh, 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 bottleneck, you know what I'm saying? Uh, chaos in their own system. So they can't do business as usual. So we have to teach people how to be the jurors. So um, how to answer the questions how to go down and then be on the jury so they can't just do business as usual. So again, I really appreciate this um, discussion. Um, brothers and sisters, comrades, uh, we have much work to do. This whole plenary man has inspired me um, more and more that we are winning. We see all the elements there. The revolution is live and it is lit. And it is time for us to step up and take this work to the next level. So um, let's build the George Jackson, let's build ANWO, let's build, uh, I wanna salute Deputy Chair Office too, because they doing work on, the, on this level as well with, in St. Louis, us having um, places where um, brothers and sisters will have a place to stay and that whole work economy, all that. That's us saying they can't take this, they, they, they can't have this conversation. We are gonna be on every front um, with programs, and ways to make sure that we lead this discussion when we talk about who is a political prisoner and um, how we should organize around political prisoners. So again, I just wanna salute this amazing plenary, Uhuru. Uhuru. <clears throat> how are we doing for time, comrades? How are we doing for time? Uhuru. Uhuru. Can you hear me, comrades? How we have are we doing 20 for minutes. time? A little, yes. How much? 20 yeah, minutes. Me, I, I want to just appreciate so much everything that's been said uh, uh, by these comrades up to now. 
And uh, I want to uh, help everybody to understand when you recognize colonialism, you recognize that relationship we have to United States government, all of its institutions is illegitimate. Uh, it's legal because the, 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 the state has the ability to legalize itself. So they can go in and make it legal, but it's illegitimate. It has no legitimacy. There's nothing about this that we have to respect or we should respect. And uh, I just think that's really important. And I think also we talk about uh, this question of what is happening, the number of women. I saw that comrade deputy chair, I think it was, uh, 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 made uh, comments in the chat about the number of uh, the escalation. I think it's more than 500% or more escalation uh, of, uh, was it 500 or more uh, of women? Uh, uh, an, an African woman is eight times more likely than a white woman. So over a five year period, the incarceration rate of African women increased by 828%. An African woman is eight times more likely than a white woman to be in prison. African women make up nearly half of the, of the country's female prison population with most serving sentences for nonviolent drug or property related uh, offenses. And the thing is that it's really important. African women make up uh, this growing number of people in prison. African men uh, make up this huge number of people in prison. Colonialism, these are colonial institutions. And what has happened, uh, uh, so I, I wanted to say that I think it's really important and I don't wanna uh, to recognize, first of all, that this whole illegitimacy of colonialism in, in terms of uh, what we, have to do to win our freedom. There are more African people in prison in the United States than there are in countries in some places in the world. There are more Africans in prison in the United States than there are people in countries in some places around the world. That's colonialism that we're looking at. And I think it's important to say that. And I also think the fact is that it's been, it's been stated uh, during this process already that uh, anybody who lives under colonial domination and is imprisoned during that process is a political pr a prisoner. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, you, there is no way. I mean, they make all the rules, they set all the terms and the terms that colonize you in the first place, put you in a situation where you would even have a relationship with them. I would know a white person if they hadn't come to Africa and kidnapped us and brought us here and what have you. So they make the laws, they come and get us and they make laws to justify coming to get us. They make laws, enslave us, uh, they enslave us and make laws to justify enslaving us. In fact, the, the law is such that you have to make a war to end that, to end it, to stop it, you know, enslaving us. So this is what we're looking at. One out of every eight human beings in, on earth who is in prison uh, is an African in the United States. This is, this is what we are looking at. So it's no legitimacy. Not legitimate if it's women, legitimate it's an illegitimate thing. So that's the first thing. Second thing has already been mentioned here uh, is that uh, there are uh, all Africans, uh, 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 it's almost like colonialism is prison. Africans funk and live as a nation behind bars. <laughs> but the thing is that there are, there are conscious political prisoners. There are political prisoners, people who become political prisoners because because they are active, because they challenge the, the, the situation. That's why it's really important for us to recognize that uh, because we have to give special attention to those comrades who made a determination, I'm gonna fight these, I'm gonna fight them. I'm gonna try to change this either in the beginning or once they get there and they, they learn stuff. We have to make that distinction even though we know everybody's a political prisoner, but we gotta pay attention to those comrades who stepped up and stepped and say that I'm taking everybody out of here. I'm taking everybody, all of us are nation behind bars, but I intend to take everybody out of prison. That's what it happened. I think it's really important for us to recognize, especially people like Sundiata. I, I visit Sundiata in prison. I used, to, I used to think, you know, how to break him out of prison. That was my plot. I go to visit uh, uh, Sundiata when he was locked up in Trenton, New Jersey, and I'm watching this whole process that we can get him out of here. You understand? I don't care. It's, about the law or anything, except I don't want to be trapped by it. You, but so the thing is, get everybody out, and all of them have to be out of prison. Um, so I, I think it's important to recognize the significance of these political prisoners uh, who are conscious, who actually said that black people are a nation behind bars, and I'm going to take everybody out. I'm going to break them out. I'm going to help 
and become organized to get everybody out. Uh, so we have to do everything we can to support those. And what happened in this country uh, is that, that some people don't understand. And this includes some people who've been involved in trying to deal with the political prisoner issue. Uh, they don't understand that uh, uh, because, because there was no meaningful help for those Africans who went to prison. When there was no meaningful help coming from outside, from black people, African who were not in prison. And that's because to crush the black liberation movement, they put damn near everybody in prison. There was nobody out to help. There was, the organizations were destroyed, wiped out and what have you. And the party was one of the few organizations that was out here trying to build. And we recognized that they were in prison as political prisoners because of an assault on the black revolution. They didn't just, uh, they were not just locked up. They were locked up because they were, they were uh, meaningful uh, forces to make this revolution. So we have to continue this revolution. And the part of the process of continuing this revolution has to be go back and get these comrades and do what we can to get them out. I mean, we got people who, who they, they, they call us, you know, like they treat like it's some kind of uh, a victory. They keep a comrade, lock him up in prison, and then let him out two weeks before he dies or something to that effect. We got uh, uh, Rush, uh, we got people like Rushel McGee been locked up for 64 years, soon the other for more than 50 years in prison, an old man uh, in prison. And this is ruthless about on the part of the colonizer. They know exactly what they do. And they know that the only reason they can get away with doing it is because of lack of organization and clarity on the part of the African people. So that's why the party is so important and why we have to take on this question of political prisoners in a very serious way. I look at things uh, like somebody mentioned this before, because they open all kinds of doors to make sure Africans go into prison. So you have a situation. This is what must be understood. It was already mentioned inferred. You have a situation where uh, the, the integrationists fight to integrate everything in America, integrate to get into the school system. So the white man lets you go to school with the white people, but when they let you go to school with the white people, they put the police on the campus to protect the white children, protect the white teachers who are gonna run everything in there. They call them resource, some kind of school resource officers. They're not there to, to keep people from shooting uh, the students. Or the, like, that's the white people doing that kind of stuff. They put them there everywhere. They put barb they put fences around campus to separate the, uh, the, the African community from the campus, that kind of thing. And so they set up a situation where you're, there's a much greater likelihood that Africans are going to go to prison right there in school. Uh, how, many, how many videos have you seen how the cops on the school come there and crush African people? We've seen white cops, body slam uh, African girls and things like that. That's the situation we live at. And, and it's colonialism. It's a rotten, foul social system. America is a colonial empire and it was born as a colonial empire. And it's gonna have to be destroyed as a political empire, uh, colonial empire. And the thing is that you hear people talking about justice for the, you can't get justice from the white man. You can't get justice from the colonizer. You get justice when you take your own power and you get justice and out, part of our power uh, has to be for the purpose of locking up the white man, locking up the colonizer, putting them in jail for the crimes that they committed against African people and actually being able to have trials such as what we started doing in 1982 with the World Tribunal on Reparations, that's the kind of thing that's going to make the difference is you have to have the power to do that. State power is what it takes to do that. And so just to be fighting to make white people like you or to make America better, uh, to improve the system or something like that, well, you'll be here forever. And our objective has to be to get out of here and to free them all and to free comrades like Sundiata and all these other men and women who had the courage to step forward and to try to make this revolution to rescue our people because they don't believe in this law themselves in that way. They will legalize themselves. I've been in courtrooms. I've been in courtroom where they had this young brother, uh, Andre Shelton, uh, who uh, uh, took a fall because a young uh, African woman uh, uh, may have been in the movement at that time, uh, uh, was accused of having stolen $10 worth of groceries. He accepted it as something he did. And the white man, the judge said uh, 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 from his bench that if I believe that you believe what Joe Waller believes, I'm gonna give you everything I, give, I can and gave this young brother 10 years in prison. That's what the America, that's what their belief is in this law and the social system and rule by law has nothing to do with us. It's ruled without regards for law. 
that we live under, which is nothing but dictatorship, and that's what colonialism is. So uh, we have to, this is a really important uh, struggle that we have to be involved in. So I, I don't, uh, I don't want to, you know, belabor this, and I, I know that I probably uh, exhausted the time that we have uh, for this panel. Uhuru to come at. Uhuru Chairman. Oh, Chairman, I just want to ignite with everything you said. Free them all, free them all, free them all. I want to appreciate everything you just laid out, Chairman. Uh, we do have about 10 minutes, nine, 10 minutes to, to cover a few questions. Um, I just want to read one comment real quick from our comrade uh, King L. It says, uh, true indeed, Chairman, the, the statistics are staggering. Really appreciate that distinction you made between legal and legitimate. And also, let's go, on, let's go to the questions now. We have uh, one from the top. This is actually a question from, from me. Uh, Chairman, <clears throat> can you speak a little on what you mean when you say turn prisons into revolutionary universities? Yeah, um, um, it, it, that's one of the reasons they fight to keep the burning spirit from getting into the newspaper and getting into the prisons. When that newspaper hits that prison, they literally wear it out. I mean, they really wear it out. They pass it from cell to cell, from cell. So we're having a little bit of block okay. cell block. Africans are reading this, studying this. Malcolm achieved much of his interest, but he really don't have access to that much. And uh... yeah, who chairman? It seems like we we're getting some um some uh, distortions on your end. Is anybody experiencing the same thing? Once in prison, if they are yes. provided, uh, you have a student to be there and lock into a uh, people uh, in trial room. Hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's looking a little, yeah, it's looking a little granny. Yeah, well, we did catch what you were saying, Chairman, just about how the, um, the efforts to stop the spear from making it into the prisons. And um, and I've heard that same thing too, that it gets passed around from cell to cell to where it's basically in, in pieces falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. But um, if your feedback or if your feedback is back, if you want to sum it up again, Chairman, and we can- move Well, to I just want to, is this, is this better um, in yes. terms of, uh, yep. yeah, I just want to say that uh, uh, these Africans who are in these prisons, uh, what we find is if they have access to uh, Yes, we're having the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's all right. Well, uh, uh, to information, to theory, to uh, an offer. Listen, what do we got in the I'm frozen. Yes, yes, yes. It looks like you're frozen. It's like so, uh, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll back off and, and let, let you come. It looks like my internet uh, situation is rather shaky, so I'll, I'll let you have it. Uh -huh. It looks like Zoom. Uh -huh. Just wanted to um, just unite oh, with him and about, um, about the the you know because you know my daughter's father is in prison and he was being some you know I sent him the burning spear and then he also would be confronted by some other burning spears that were circling around mm -hmm. in his same prison and how you know people would just you know and you know would just say oh I pass it around here and here and I, so I just wanted to unite with that and just you know really share that uh, yeah well. and um i just wanted to unite with that as well and say that you know um it, because of the burning spirit going into the um prisons we receive so many letters mm -hmm. from inmates all the time um you know writing us um from and appreciating the burning spirit newspaper and we had an inmate that had his own check. He took his own resources um, and wanted to become beyond just the George Jackson. He sent, you know, he wanted to become a member mm -hmm. of EPDOM. And so um, it's just <clears throat> so powerful to see. Um, we don't even seen um, members of our party that um, got the Burning Spear newspaper, became a member and got out, you know, and um, joined the ranks on the grounds right. um, of our movement. And so I just, you know, just really wanted to say that um, because I didn't know um, that really the first introduction I had to the party was before Mike Brown died because my brother had heard of the Burning Spirit newspaper and he used to bring it when he come to the visiting room and he used to always want to, but I used to feel like it was like against God or something, you know, because he was getting political in jail, but we were raised Christian. So when I would go visit him, 
right. he would come, you know, wanting to share this new information that he was finding in, in prison. And so, you know, like he even had, you know, heard of the Burning Spring newspaper, had been um, influenced by the Burning Spring newspaper in prison. This, um, I wanted to uh, add to that, that, you know, Anwar had uh, an initiative a few years ago about really raising the amounts of Burning Spring newspapers that would go to African women in prisons, mm. because um, we recognize that they, there wasn't an, enough of that. And really, um, African women are starving <laughs> for this information. And when they don't have it, they are left to believe that the reason why they're in prison is because of their own doing, not recognizing that if the majority of African women are going to prison on drug charges, then they need to have something that explains to them how the drugs got into the community and how this is participating and so contributing toward them being incarcerated. And so I'm going to put a call out here that if you know of any African women in prison or just sponsor it so that we can send more African women in prison, Burning Spear newspapers, I think that we should do that. So go sign up on the Burning Spear, the Burning Spear.com website and sponsor a prisoner and just make sure that we can send it to an African woman in prison because that's really, um, we need to have more African women coming out of those institutions politicized. Uhuru. And part of what was a really important stuff that, that we've used, I'm still bad, aren't I? The sound is still messed up. We can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, part of what needs to happen is uh, work that we used to do, and we would go to prisons, and especially on visiting days and things like that, and we would pass out propaganda to visitors who were going in to see prisoners, mm. and, uh, 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 and they would, you know, take information. We would... Uh, 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 pass information out when they were coming out of prisons, and this would uh, somehow affect their ability to communicate. And we could do that at women's prisons as well, and I think that that would be uh, part of the way we reached uh, reach them. And we we would uh, organize a uh, uh, capacity to take people to visit in the prisons because uh, the fact is, as it was already mentioned by somebody, uh, they build these prisons uh, uh, in these uh, way out places to help uh, become a part of the economy. Uh, for these white people. So white people now who had no economy uh, uh, at all, now they got a Walmart, they got, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, things. You got phone companies that charge extraordinary amounts of money uh, for people to use the prisoners to use the phone or the families of the prisoners to pay the phone to be able to talk to them. Whole industry grow up around that. And that, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that people are confronted with and they can't get there. So we need to be able uh, to organize uh, uh, on such and such a day, on uh, however often a month, where people can sign up and we can, they might be able to contribute to gas or something like that, and we can get them uh, to the prisons to visit. We can do propaganda work when we do that, uh, when we're going in, uh, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And they will, that will be a way that we can reach those sisters who are locked up in those prisons, as well as, as other uh, African men as, uh, who are locked up. Uhuru. Let me tell you, you know, they're very vicious. Colonialism is, is cannot be, you can't overstate uh, the cruelty of colonialism. Every aspect of our life under colonial mode of production, they take our children and you find them now uh, creating situations where they were sent children uh, 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 into uh, adult prisons. And they know the consequences of that for these boys. These boys are gonna be raped. They know it, and they set up. They set that up, and then, and when these boys come out of prison, then they, uh, um, you know, they, they are real contradictions inside the community. They, they, they contribute to a social destabilization in the communities that's already been state destabilized. So you got whole communities, especially in public housing, that's uh, that's where you have just African mothers and children are living there because the men are in prison or because the the system itself. Uh, requires there not to be any men if there's so-called welfare and that kind of stuff is going to come there. There's, there's no aspect of our lives under colonialism that is what might be considered normal except normal oppression, normal exploitation, normal, hu normal humiliation. That's the thing that we live with and that's what we have to overturn. That's why those brothers and sisters go to prisons, political prison, because they're tired of it and they have decided they're going to start to try and do something about it. We have to create a pillar of the ability to turn the entire African community into uh, something that's hostile to colonialism. Chairman Mao Zedong once said that the gorilla has to be like the fish in the sea, recognizing the sea is the people. 
And in order for the guerrilla to be successful, we have to do a certain element of politicizing that community. Uh, so there's a place uh, for them and the whole community becomes weapons. Uh, we talk about people's war against colonialism. Uhuru, comrade. Uh, all right, so we have, oh, go ahead, comrade. Were you no. gonna say the question? <laughs> okay, you said next question. This is a question. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, and I was going to say, um, we actually have a little bit more time. So we're going to take some more questions that we have as well. So this uh, question is from Comrade Soli on YouTube. And it kind of folds into a, a question that Comrade Dexter posed uh, during one of the presentations. So her question is, what's the importance of emphasizing, quote, unquote, all when we say free them all? And um, the part of the question that comrade Dexter raised was, you know, in the panel, we discussed like even the killers and the molesters, like, you know, so how do we just like, how do we expand that um, and expound on that? Uh -huh. How do you, how do you say <coughs> that I'm against colonialism when it comes to the police shooting you, but I'm for colonialism for the police putting you in jail or putting somebody in jail that does something that we don't like. It's like, in slavery, African people were in slavery. There were African people who were enslaved and actually killed other African people, stole from other African people. So you say, okay, boss, uh, they did this to us and so boil them in oil. The thing is that it's an illegitimate relationship. And what we do is struggle for legitimacy by taking the power ourselves. We are the ones who will make that decision. And if somebody, and if necessary, we set up the circumstances, we have the trial ourselves in our communities uh, based on the recognition of, uh, of everything and what it means to our community. And then we take care of it. And we develop forces who are capable of taking care of it. That's the responsibility that we have. And to be uh, in a situation where we are pleading, you know, oh, you know, uh, that let's call the police to solve the problem, that doesn't work for us. The police never solve the problem. I don't know of a single issue, an instance in our history where the police solved the problem for us. And I challenge anybody to tell me how the police solved the problem, ever. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm saying. The state, the colonial state cannot solve the problem. We have to assume responsibility as men and women to solve these problems uh, ourselves. Uhuru. 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 You know, Chairman, I um, was wanting to see if you can deepen when, because um, when you were talking, it brought me back to how you explain how this colonial um, contradiction that we're talking about, it shows itself in so many different ways even when we see how, you know, um, trying to have babies, when mm -hmm. all these African men locked up mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and then the contradiction of how many men to women, the ratio um, of men and women. And even, you know, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, um, like in the hood, and I'm sure this is across the nation, you know, um, a person, he goes to jail and the sister, you know what I'm saying? She has to depend on, you know, um, the community in a certain way. Um, because he's out of the house. But then that comes in a contradiction of when he comes home because of now she don't had another man or, you know, just all the contradictions that comes along with this, this whole thing. I love when you break that down because people have to understand, of uh, you know, this is, this is why you don't have a man. You know what I'm saying? Because they lock I mean, them up. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's incredible contradiction. And the colonizer is vicious. <clears throat> because the fact is that human animals are sexual animals, uh, among other things. You don't lose sexuality uh, because somebody goes to prison. You find other means uh, through which you express your sexuality. And so uh, if, if all the men are locked up, uh, uh, several different kinds of things happen. Uh, isn't that right? I mean, uh, you find uh, men uh, within achieve a certain kind of arrogance because of all so many women are available and uh, and and act a certain way in relationship to women you find women who despise that kind of arrogance in our community and have to find other ways uh, for intimacy that's not degrading that's not humiliating uh, uh, everybody want to have a, a, a some kind of intimacy mm. that's a natural normal kind of thing for human beings and so we find avenues and venues through which to express our, our sexual being, our sexuality. And if we're gonna do that, even if like in Ferguson, there's only something like 65 men for every 100 women. 
And in general, uh, uh, Comrade yesterday, I think, made the point about 1.5 uh, uh, million uh, African people having disappeared. Uh, in general, you know, you're, there's something like only 88 um, men uh, uh, for every 100 women. And, and of course, there are different places where that, that ratio is uh, even more exaggerated than that. So how do, what do people do? What do people do? What do human animals do? Uh, under those circumstances. So we find means by which we, we try, we really want to try to find means to which we can, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, exercise, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, human uh, 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 sexual desires and things like that. Uh, and that causes all kinds of distortions in our community. Uh, uh, you, you think you are in, engaging in what, <laughs> what is a normal relationship and, uh, and you're clever enough uh, to be able to come up and write treatises on why it's normal, uh, because we have to satisfy, you know, our own sense of morality to do what it is the hell we do. But we've been funneled into certain directions by social, uh, 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 you know, what do you call it, uh, engineering, you know, so uh, certain things you can be guaranteed to happen uh, 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 based on uh, how, how Africans uh, are treated, and uh, this is one of them. And this whole thing that they do to disrupt our families uh, mm -hmm. and, and prison functions also as a firm of, form of birth control. Mm -hmm. Prisons function as a form of birth control that is imposed on the African colonized community. And because who's in prison except those, uh, particularly those African men uh, and then women who are uh, uh, at this ripe age, you know, like in terms of reproduction. So uh, the white man who is disappearing from the face of the earth in part uh, because uh, African women are not, uh, white women are not having enough babies to, uh, to maintain even the population stability, uh, uh, make sure uh, that, uh, that you can't have any babies either. They bomb the, the, the clinics where white women will have abortions do all of that kind of stuff, you know, to prevent that from happening on the one hand and lock up Africans and lock up Mexicans and lock up indigenous people uh, so that uh, and it functions as a form of birth control. Uh, this is a losing battle they engaged in for any number of reasons, but uh, that's part of what is happening with us. So uh, Uhuru, Uhuru. Uhuru. Comrade Lisa Davis uh, uh, in the comment uh, says something about they have also literally experimented on black people behind bars with depo provera, which mm -hmm. is known to cause sterilization in men. Mm -hmm. I mean, so well, once once they get you, uh, uh, they've got you. And that was one of the things I used to love about the members of the Black Liberation Army. I mm -hmm. used to love it because these comrades did not believe in staying in prison. They did not believe in staying in prison. I mean, these cats were going to definitely try to get out of the prison. They did not believe in the legitimacy of the system at all. Mm. Uh, that was the main characteristic of the history of the Black Liberation Army. That's how they, how they moved. And of course, uh, with, the, with the fact that the, a movement has aged uh, in a sense that, uh, that uh, uh, the organizations were destroyed and, and what have you to do that. And these Africans have been in the prisons have had to build their own committees to try to get out of prison and stuff like that. There was no revolutionary organization, no revolutionary strategic approach that was made uh, by the revolution itself. And so uh, uh, over a period of time of being locked up, uh, uh, that character has been um, uh, neutralized to a great extent about Africans uh, being willing to do what's necessary to get, well, to do, to get out of those prisons. So now, uh, because of that, uh, getting out of prison becomes a matter of satisfying the legal requirements and, and not just legal requirements, because they've been keeping these Africans up, even though they've satisfied all the legal requirements, they want them to scrape and bow. They want to be able, if they let them out, they want to send them out as something that would tell the rest of the African people, this is an example of what will become of you. Uh, mm -hmm. to turn them uh, into some other kinds of animals that are uh, whips and uh, somebody who was it said that sometime we're going to punk them out. Uh, uh, that's what they, that's what they uh, intend to do. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Uhuru. Uhuru. Um, I appreciate that. I want to appreciate everybody who participated on this panel. Um, I know we had time at this point. Uh, I, I just want to just uh, end by just reiterating what uh, the, the burning spear commented here. 
It says, keep the spear burning inside the wall. And, 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 and come at Dexter, somebody Ooh. mentioned it, but it must be mentioned again. Yeah. The program that we are developing right there in Oakland, California, I mean, in, in St. Louis, uh, with, the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the Black Power Blueprint, uh, with the workforce, uh, uh, African independence workforce thing, where we are opening up this, uh, the bakery cafe, and uh, we are setting up a situation where comrades who are in prison uh, can come out of prison. There's a place for them to live. They can go into this uh, program. And the program, uh, there are four plexes, and every one of the four plexes is named for a political prisoner, Sundiata, uh, mm. uh, 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 and, and uh, I think Asada, uh, mm. uh, Matula Shakur, uh, uh, and, and somebody else. Uh, and the whole uh, thing is named uh, for comrade, uh, uh, um, um, I mean, out, of, uh, out of Alabama, for comrade Mufundile. So, I mean, our attachment to this question is very real. Mm -hmm. And uh, we institutionalize this attachment and this struggle. And we've tried to facilitate that also through our work in, in the Black is Back Coalition. Uhura Comrades, Dexter and Wazy, um, I know that I stole a little time. I, I felt like I had a little juice and could might be able to get away with it. Hey, use the juice, use the juice, comrade. Use the juice, free them all, free them all. Oh, free them all. Yes, free them all.